screen. Hello and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff and I am a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. I'm coming to you today from the distance learning room at the Royal BC Museum, located on the traditional territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, the Lekwungen people here in Victoria, British Columbia. This series started when we were asked to work from home <laughs> and I had the pleasure of speaking to, with my colleagues in different departments about their work since March of 2020. Today, we are talking with our curator of paleontology, Dr. Victoria Arbor. Victoria joined the Royal BC Museum in 2018 and is a vertebrate paleontologist and evolutionary biologist, and is the leading expert on the paleobiology of the armored dinosaurs known as ankylosaurs. Today, we're gonna to talk about a recent paper that she co-authored with Dr. David Evans, dinosaur paleontologist at the Royal Ontario Museum. In this paper, they examine healed dinosaur armor that suggests how tail clubs might have been used. I won't say any more about it. You may have already heard it a little bit more. Uh, but Victoria, let's first talk about ankylosaurs and who is Zool? We've seen Zool's name come up here in people's favorite dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, Zool is definitely one of my favorite dinosaurs. I'm a little bit biased because I helped name it. Um, yeah, so Zool is a type of armored dinosaur called an ankylosaur. And I think what I'll do actually is just start sharing my screen so we can look at some pictures of ankylosaurs while sure. I talk about them. So let me bear with me while I get my screen going here. We're gonna share screen and pull out this. All right. So yeah, so armored dinosaurs are these really cool dinosaurs. I would argue that they're the best dinosaurs. Okay. <laughs> um, they are called armored dinosaurs because all throughout their skin, they have um, special bony plates and spikes called osteoderms. So this is very different from anything that we really have in our bodies. Uh, they are um, growing in the lower layer of the skin. So your skin kind of has two layers to it, the epidermis and then the dermis under that. In us, uh, our hair and our sweat glands are found in the dermis, but in dinosaurs like ankylosaurs, that's where the osteoderms grow. So imagine having little bones kind of like set in the sort of lower layer of your skin there. Mm -hmm. um, so very weird. Osteoderms are also found in modern animals like crocodiles, turtles, some kinds of lizards like Gila monsters, and also armadillos. So they're actually relatively common, uh, but they would feel really weird for us as humans, I think. Um, so that's the most characteristic part of armored dinosaurs. Some other things to know about them are that they're herbivores, they walk around on four legs, and unlike most dinosaurs that are kind of tall and svelte, they are squat and uh, flat, <laughs> so they have kind of a unique body shape even among uh, um, dinosaurs. Awesome. Um, so uh, I think I'll just like get into things here. Um, so let's talk about Zool specifically. So Zool is a unique species of armored dinosaur that was found in 2014. The skeleton is known from a very complete skeleton that I'll sort of share with you throughout the talk today. Uh, found in 2014 in northern Montana in a town called Haver. It was found on uh, a private ranch uh, on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Uh, and it was of particular interest to the Royal Ontario Museum where the specimen resides now uh, because the Royal Ontario Museum crew and the, I was a postdoctoral fellow at the time of uh, working on Zool at the beginning. Uh, they do a lot of their work in southern Alberta looking at the dinosaurs found around many berries and sort of south of Medicine Hat. But the rocks that are found in southern Alberta are the same rocks that go into northern Montana. So the ROM crew had been finding lots and lots of dinosaurs but they hadn't found an ankylosaur yet. So when there was an opportunity opportunity to add an ankylosaur uh, to the collection that kind of filled out the, um, the sort of fauna of this area, they sort of jumped on it. Uh, Zool was first found by a commercial excavation company, so a company that goes and like legally collects dinosaurs from private land and then sells usually to museums. Um, and so they actually weren't planning on digging up an ankylosaur. They were digging up a Gorgosaurus, a type of Tyrannosaur that had been weathering out of this hill. And as they were digging a big hole to find all of the bones of this Tyrannosaur, they bumped into the tip of what would become Zool's tail. And then they knew they had something really special because ankylosaurs are not very common dinosaurs to find ever, basically. Uh, so even though tyrannosaurs get a lot of the attention, the ankylosaur is actually kind of the star of this particular excavation. 
So uh, they knew they had something really interesting. Uh, and so as a result, they dug this gigantic, um, just colossal <laughs> hole in the ground. So all of this is uh, excavated with heavy machinery to get the ankylosaur that would become Zool out of the ground. Uh, Zool also lived about 75 million years ago in a rock formation called the Judith River Formation. And just from this quarry alone, we can actually reconstruct Zool's environment with a really high degree of accuracy. So a lot of this work is still work that's ongoing as we try to identify all the fossils, but hundreds of other fossils were found alongside Zool and this Gorgosaurus. So that's the Tyrannosaur in the middle of this picture. Uh, we have bones from an ostrich mimic dinosaur called an Ornithomimid, which is the feathery one towards the right. There's a horned dinosaur in the quarry, duckbill dinosaur, there's a bunch of turtles, there's a crocodile, we've got beautiful leaves that really tell us about the trees and plants that made up this environment or Zool's food. Some of those leaves have little insect bites on them, so we have records of the insects that would have lived here even if we don't have their fossils themselves. Um, and we can even tell things like what direction the river was flowing that Zool was kind of buried in and what the climate was kind of like and how far away from the ocean it was. So we have all of this amazing information uh, that kind of fills in Zool's ecosystem as well. So I just want to make sure everyone knows that Zool is really cool, but it's also part of this broader uh, um, broader story about dinosaurs and dinosaur evolution, which I think is really great. But Zool is pretty special. Um, some of the work that I did as a PhD student when I was at the University of Alberta was really digging into how we tell different species of ankylosaurs apart. Uh, and in particular, uh, a really big focus was on the dinosaurs, uh, the ankylosaurs of Western North America. So like Alberta, Montana, New Mexico, sort of all of that um, sort of Western, Western uh, North America area. Uh, and so that involved looking at dozens and dozens of skulls and spending a lot of time just staring at them and thinking really hard about them and trying to understand how many species we were looking at. And even though some of the skulls can be quite similar, there's also some really distinct differences that we can use to tell different species apart within Alberta and Montana. And so this is some of the work that I did where we looked at, say, like, you know, how long and sharp are the horns on the back of the skull? What's the pattern of these sort of tile-like ornamentation across the snout? Do they have little extra ornaments like around the eyes or not. Uh, and all of these kind of small details can help us tell different species apart. We can also use the shape of the tail club uh, to help tell species apart, which is really helpful. Uh, so that all really laid the groundwork for me to, as a postdoc at the ROM, tell that Zool was a new species. Um, so we couldn't really assign Zool to any of these species that had already been known before. It has distinctive horns, it has distinctive ornamentation across the snout. So that meant we got to give it the new scientific name Zool Curvistator. So the first part of Zool's name, which is kind of like the Tyrannosaurus of T-Rex, uh, is in reference to this monster from the 1980s Ghostbuster movie, also named Zool. So Zool italicized is the dinosaur, and Zool not italicized is the movie monster. Uh, and we felt that it had a pretty good resemblance uh, to that particular head, minus the big fangs, because Zool the dinosaur is a plant eater. Uh, and we mostly thought it was funny. The name was actually said as a joke at first between myself and my collaborator, David Evans. But then once we said it out loud, it just kind of stuck and we couldn't not call it that from that point on. So that became its scientific name. The second part of Zool's name is Curvastator, so that's like the Rex part of T-Rex. Uh, and Curvastator is Latin for destroyer of shins. <laughs> and that's in reference to Zool's really amazing tail and tail club. So this is a picture of me at the ROM a couple of years ago, laying next to Zool's tail. Uh, the tail would connect to the hips towards the sort of bottom right of this image. And then the tip of the tail is pointing towards the left and it has that big ball of bone at the end. Uh, and Kylosaur tails are super unique among all kinds of dinosaurs because the front part of the tail is flexible. So about the first half of the tail is flexible, but then the second half, the tail club is stiff, kind of like a sledgehammer or a battle ax. So all of the bones of the tail kind of lock together and fuse together. Uh, Zool has these big spikes that go all the way down the tail, but then the osteoderms at the tip of the tail are huge and kind of bulbous and they envelop the tip of the tail and create what we call the knob of the tail club. Very technical scientific term there. So this is pretty neat and Zool's tail is very impressive with all of these spikes running down the side. So this is a really interesting part of Zool's anatomy. 
Uh, so the reason we say destroyer of shins is because the general idea is that ankylosaur tail clubs could be used as weapons. So they could be swung from side to side with great force uh, to be used to strike at potential enemies. Although who those enemies are, we're going to get to in a few minutes. So some of the work that I did uh, earlier on in my career was looking at exactly how hard an ankylosaur like Zool could swing its tail into something. And so um, a measurement of force in science is called a Newton. So that's how hard something could impact something else. Uh, and so someone who is a, I once gave a talk where I called a boxer a professional puncher, and now I always think of that when I read this slide. <laughs> and so a professional puncher uh, can hit with about 2,000 newtons of force, and a baseball bat hits a baseball with about 3,500 newtons of force. An animal like Zool would be swinging its tail with at least 10,000 newtons of force and maybe more. Uh, which makes a lot of sense. Zool is an animal that's six or seven meters long. So just from size alone, that kind of makes sense. But they have very muscly tails and uh, the tail is adapted for really being able to swing with quite a lot of velocity and impact force. So we know that they could be used as really good weapons. You would not want to be anywhere near Zool's tail club or any of the spikes along its tail when it gets whipping it around. The general idea over the last hundred years or so has been that ankylosaurs would probably use their tails as defensive weapons against predators. So this is a little gif of ankylosaurus versus T-Rex from a documentary a few years ago. And ankylosaurs could only really swing their tails from side to side, not really up and down very much. That's just not the way the tailbones sort of move around each other. Uh, and so if you're a two-legged predator, um, this is still a pretty good defensive weapon because you do not want your ankle to get broken. And this is where destroyer of shins comes from. This idea that ankylosaurs could swing their tail clubs from side to side right into a shin or ankle of an attacking theropod uh, as a very good weapon. And so this is probably something they were able to do. Whether or not they actually did do it becomes really hard to answer. Uh, in paleontology, we can't go back and look at animal behavior just with our eyes. So we have to use different lines of evidence to figure out you know, the behavior of dinosaurs that we can't observe directly. So this idea that ankylosaurs use their tails as defensive weapons is really common. It's, it's basically how scientists like myself thought about it. It's also how most artistic depictions uh, show ankylosaurs wielding their tail clubs. And I got really interested in this kind of relationship between art and science starting around 2015. So I started asking uh, my social media followers to send me pictures of ankylosaurs fighting other anything, whatever they're using their tail club against, send me the your childhood books or documentaries or videos, anything where you have an example. So I got over 100, 150 responses over the years. We use the hashtag ankylosaur fight club on Twitter. Uh, and I got some really fun results. Um, the vast majority of the time, ankylosaurs, if they're shown using their tail clubs, it's against some kind of predator, uh, usually tyrannosaurs, because those are the predators that they lived alongside um, accurately. <laughs> but we also found the, that people were uh, would depict them uh, fighting dinosaurs they didn't live alongside, like spinosaurus. Ankylosaurs and spinosaurus don't live together. Uh, we had examples of them fighting humans. We had examples of them fighting like fictional dinosaurs. Almost no examples of ankylosaurs fighting other ankylosaurs, which I thought was really interesting. Victoria, because, oh, sorry. Yes. Is that not an ankylosaur there in about the middle with that sort of turquoise color? Yeah, right in the middle. So out of all of these responses, I think we got about two examples oh, of um, okay. artists showing ankylosaurs fighting other ankylosaurs. But we actually had um, almost as many examples of them fighting fictional animals and humans as we do fighting other ankylosaurs. And it looks which like I thought was super interesting. Too. <laughs> yeah, and then dragonflies. insects and then flying okay. uh, reptiles called pterosaurs, which I thought was quite funny. So um, yeah, and I'm sure there's still more examples of different things out there, but this was a pretty fun uh, sort of informal survey. So I thought that was super interesting because if we look at modern animals that have specialized weapons, that is usually used for fighting members of your own species. So if you think about things like deer, moose, bighorn sheep, antelopes, buffalo, um, they usually have uh, horns or antlers on their head, sort of specialized weapons, and those weapons have evolved for basically battling um, each other, usually related to mating or some sort of resource related to mating. 
So that's a type of evolution we call sexual selection rather than natural selection, which is more like the influence of predators on your body anatomy. So ankylosaurs are kind of interesting because they have this specialized weapon, but it's not on their head, which is really weird. So it's a little hard to compare directly with modern mammals. And then the other weird thing about ankylosaurs is that, of course, they're also over the rest of their body covered in spiky body armor. And in living animals today that are really, really spiky, uh, if you think about lizards or um, even things like porcupines and hedgehogs, that's usually kind of passive defense against predators, especially a special kind of predator called a gape-limited predator. That's basically just a fancy way of saying a predator that swallows you whole instead of chewing you up. Uh, so that's a, in the case of this lizard, you know, a lot of birds, they don't chew their food, they just sort of cork you back and like swallow you whole. And if you're really spiky, that makes it really hard to do. So ankylosaurs have this kind of interesting mix of like passive defense of spiky body armor and then something that looks a bit more like active defense like what we'd see for intraspecific combat. Uh, so could it be that ankylosaur tail clubs didn't really evolve specifically against predators but really more for fighting members of their own species like other ankylosaurs? This is a really hard question to answer, and this is where we get back to Zool, because Zool actually gives us some really interesting clues about, um, about that question. So when we first described Zool in 2017 and gave it the scientific name, Zool Curvastator, we just had the skull and the tail club prepared out of the rock, because the body had been collected in this giant blob of rock, uh, and it was going to take a few years to get it all cleaned up and ready to study. Zool was found uh, upside down. So uh, when Zool died, it rolled onto his back and then got preserved belly up. So that was the first side that was visible when Zool was collected. So this is a picture of myself, David Evans, and paleo artist extraordinaire Danielle Dufo, whose art you've seen throughout this, um, this presentation. Uh, we're standing next to Zool's belly. So you're sort of looking down into or like up into Zool's rib cage. Some of these big flat bones, the brown bones that we see, those are his hips. Uh, you can sort of see the vertebrae or the backbones going up sort of along the edge of this picture here. And then the body kind of disarticulates a little bit and the head was kind of found rolled off to the side over towards the right of this image. And the tail would be sticking off the left uh, lower corner here. Uh, so this is really great. We were really excited about how nice this was looking, and we were really hoping that because Zool was preserved upside down, that the armor plates would actually be preserved in their original positions uh, when Zool was alive. So we were really optimistic that because this was so well preserved, when it got flipped over, the armor would be there. The reason I was excited about this is because most of, oh, but part of the problem was that Zool was in this giant block, so it was about 35,000 pounds when it was, um, when it was collected. Uh, it was actually too big to bring into the Royal Ontario Museum uh, because it exceeded all of the floor loading. So it would have basically like broken the floor to bring it into the museum. And it was too big to fit through any of the doors. So all of this work had to happen um, at this really great company uh, based in Trenton, Ontario. They're called Research Casting International. They do fossil preparation and museum exhibit fabrication. So they had a really great team who helped us just study Zool by preparing it. Uh, preparing it took a lot of effort, and I think this is a really interesting aspect of studying large dinosaurs, is just being able to actually maneuver these big blocks around. So in order to get Zool prepared from the other side so we could see Zool's back, uh, they basically had to build a cage around the block and then saw it in half and flip it over. So this is, this is a lot of engineering, a lot of really interesting technical work involved in, in getting Zool flipped over. So this is sort of partway through the flip and then lowering it down onto the ground, and you can see sort of in the back of the image, that's the remaining chunk of Zool that was cut off once we figured out sort of about how deep to go down so that they could actually flip it over. Uh, so that was really exciting, a really like sort of nail biting day watching that get like flipped over. But what was super exciting was as Zool started to get prepared, uh, we were all correct and the original collection team was correct that the armor and skin were actually preserved in place. So this is about halfway through preparing the back uh, with one of the lead preparators here, um, slowly ex excavating it. And what you're seeing are Zool's spikes, all of those spiky armor plates and the actual skin preserved in place as well as so all of the scales in between those big bony spikes. So we were super excited about this. Um, uh, and yeah, then the final result, I just had a chance to go visit Zool again last week and see everything kind of laid out. Uh, so we've got the tail and the head and the body all laid out together. Um, we have this basically beautiful picture of Zool and it basically looks like what it would have looked like while he was alive. So this is really, really special. 
Uh, and like I said, part of the reason this is so exciting is that most of the time when I look at ankylosaur fossils, I open up drawers of little cookies, basically. So uh, usually all of the osteoderms have fallen away from the skeleton in where they would have been found originally, because they're part of the skin, the skin decomposes, and then they kind of wash away. And that makes it really challenging to study ankylosaurs, even just to know what they look like, let alone learn anything else about how the armor actually functioned for them while they were alive. So if I go to any, this is an example at the Royal Ontario Museum, I open up the drawer, I've got all these little disarticulated bones. Uh, and yeah, it's hard to know like what shape goes on what parts of the body, do different species have different shapes? Um, all these questions that are really hard to answer. And that's where Zool is really special because all of this armor is preserved in place, like basically where it was while Zool was walking around alive. Uh, so here's another nice view looking at Zool. So the head would be pointing to the right and you can see the tail going off into the left there. We're kind of looking at Zool's right side. Zool has all kinds of different shapes of spikes all over the body. Um, there's these big conical spikes running along the top of the back. There's big flat backswept triangles, uh, basically along the edge of the flanks. And then there's sort of big rectangular oval keels that would have gone sort of on the sides and down onto the belly. And then all around those are these little rosettes of prickly osteoderms and scales. And then between all of that are tiny, tiny ossicles, basically little millimeter sized osteoderms that fill in all of the space in between. And there would be like tens of thousands of those on Zool. So extremely well armored dinosaur, very prickly, very spiky, just a really cool dinosaur to work on. So this is just really fun. But in addition to the armor just looking so amazing, it gives us some really cool insights into Zool and some potential answers to who Zool is using its tail club against. So if we look at this particular image of the spikes, we've kind of moved around Zool's side now from the last photo. So we've got some of those really big pointy flank spikes uh, towards the right-hand side of this image. Uh, but then if you take a look, there's one that looks a little bit different and it's this one. So instead of having a nice sharp point, it actually is missing that, the tip of that osteoderm. Uh, so now and so we see kind of like a hole where the tip of the spike should be. And when I take a really close look at this in person, we actually can see that the bone is healing. Bone gets a very distinctive texture as it starts to heal uh, because it's a living tissue so it can repair itself. So we know that this is an injury that happened while Zool was alive. Uh, whatever it was, it survived and it started to heal. So it's not something that happened after Zool died or like an accident while we were preparing the fossil. So that's pretty interesting. And this is not the only osteoderm that's broken. In fact, there's quite a few damaged and healing osteoderms or we call pathological osteoderms on Zool's body. So in this particular image, the pathological osteoderms are uh, marked in red. So there's a couple on the right side and then three on the left side. Uh, and all of them are missing the tip. Some of them are fully healed uh, back to just kind of a new weird shape. And actually the horny sheath has regrown as well. So the bones aren't kind of just sticking out of the body naked. They have like a fingernail like covering. Or if you think about cow horns, they have kind of that interesting texture. Uh, so some of them look kind of like fresher injuries. Some of them look like old fully healed injuries. And what's really interesting is that they're just in this really narrow zone over the body. So we don't see them just kind of randomly distributed. Um, they're not really up by the neck or where we might expect a predator to be biting. They're just found on the flanks, back by the hips. And I think that this is really compelling evidence for injuries inflicted by another Zool. We don't see any evidence of bite marks from a predator. Uh, the distribution is basically where we would expect ankylosaurs to possibly bump each other with their tail clubs. So we've argued uh, in this recent research that these are injuries from another Zool using its tail club against this particular Zool. So what might that have looked like? Well, you can kind of imagine that ankylosaurs can't really lift their tails up very high. This is probably about as high as they could go, but you can sort of picture two ankylosaurs kind of like sidling up to each other. Uh, you're, they're in a bad mood. They're trying to fight over territory or mate or food or something like that. So they sort of size each other up and then decide to fight. And uh, they're gonna slam these tail clubs with a lot of force into each other. And it's pretty easy to imagine some of their little spikes getting broken in the process. So there's an example here of our particular Zool having a bit of a bad day with that little tip of the osteoderm just flying off and away. Um, and I think that this is really interesting, really exciting, uh, really exciting work. Now, it might be 
a little bit surprising to think about two animals kind of fighting with their tails in this way. Tail fighting is actually kind of uncommon in modern animals, but my favorite analog for what animal is sort of most like an ankylosaur is actually the giraffe. So giraffes do not really look like ankylosaurs. They're not spiky. They're very tall instead of being squat and flat. But what they have is a weapon at the end of a long, flexible neck. So they've got these horns on their head and their head is actually quite reinforced. And when giraffes need to fight over mates and territory and food, they sort of lean up against each other like this and they slam their heads into each other's necks and sides. These fights can get really rough. They often puncture holes in each other's sides and gets quite bloody. Uh, I've read reports of them breaking ribs and legs in the process. Um, so this is, you know, this is a really interesting example of battle uh, that I think if you take a giraffe and you squish it <laughs> and move the head and neck to the other side of the body, that's probably a bit what it would look like as ankylosaurs are fighting. Uh, and I would actually argue that ankylosaurs have the better solution for this particular problem because, you know, using your head as a weapon, that's where your brain and your eyes and your mouth are, all of these very critical components to surviving. Whereas a tail, you know, if your tail breaks, it's not great, but you'll live to see another day. So ankylosaurs might have actually come up with a better adaptation for this kind of fighting than giraffes have. So that brings us pretty much to the end of our presentation. I, I, I'm really excited about how just this one really well-preserved fossil gives us so much information, not just about what Zool looked like, but about reinterpreting behaviors uh, in a really new light. Um, like I said, for a long time, we've really pictured tail clubs as being primarily defensive weapons against predators. Now we've got this really tantalizing evidence that suggests that they might have really more been used against other zools and other ankylosaurs. That might actually be the whole reason they evolved in the first place, the real sort of selective pressure driving their evolution. When we were doing this study, we also took a look at any lines of evidence that might suggest that tail clubs instead evolved as a response to predators. And we just couldn't find any. We looked at whether or not tail clubs evolve uh, with specific types of predators like tyrannosaurs, they don't. Uh, they don't seem to get bigger as predators get bigger. Um, and there are also armored dinosaurs that never evolve tail clubs. They're called nodosaurid ankylosaurs. And they live in the same environments as ankylosaurid ankylosaurs with tail clubs. So there isn't really any evidence to suggest that predation underlies this really interesting adaptation. So yeah, that basically brings me to the end here. It's a really cool dinosaur with a lot of really cool stories to tell. And I think it really highlights that these dinosaurs might have a lot more to them than we've given them credit for uh, with sort of more active uh, dynamic lives than we thought previously. So uh, I'm sure there will be more Zool stories to tell in the future, but I'm really happy I got to share this with everyone here today. And I'm looking forward to answering some ankylosaur and Zool related questions now. Terrific. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, everyone, um, we've got a nice group here live on Zoom and in on Facebook, I imagine. So if you do have some questions, throw it in the chat. We have time to take a few. Victoria, you make a really convincing argument that having your weaponary, your weapon in your tail makes sense, right? Your brain's <laughs> not there, your mouth's not there, all that other stuff. Why don't we why do you think we don't see that so much in, in modern animals? It's a really interesting question. A few years ago, I looked at what sort of anatomical features were correlated or sort of co-occur um, with having tail weaponry. So there's a few examples in the whole history of life where there's something that's similar to an ankylosaur tail club. Glyptodonts, which are giant armadillo relatives, also have a tail club. Uh, so it seems like the correlations with tail weaponry include being armored, being quadrupedal, being very large. And these might just be things that are kind of adaptations you need to have in place in order to even evolve a weapon on your tail. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we don't really have a good answer for why it's not as common. It might also just be like some practical things, like it's harder to like align your bodies for battle <laughs> using a tail. So fighting head to head, you know, you can see what you're doing. You might have a little bit more control over like what you're doing. Um, but it's a really hard question to answer, and it's one of those things that I'm I'm really interested in just overall in my research program. Great. We have a couple of questions here. Uh, first one comes from Ken. Ken is wondering, how dense is the bone on the protrusions? 
Oh, that's a great question. So um, <clears throat> the osteoderms, the, the, the skin bones at the tip of the tail that we call the knob osteoderms, those are actually really spongy compared to the ones on the rest of the body. So when we've cut into uh, or when we've got broken examples of osteoderms, the spikes uh, on the body are actually quite thin in ankylosaurs. Uh, and in ankylosaurs with tail clubs, they're really thin and they have almost kind of like a plywood appearance. So they're quite strong and thin. Uh, but then the ones at the tip of the tail are really spongy inside. And my guess is that that's potentially an adaptation related to withstanding really strong impact forces that might help dissipate the stress of a tail club strike. Uh, it also might reflect that the tail club knob grows last and might be growing faster. So ankylosaurs, when they're born as babies, they don't have their armor. They're kind of naked looking. <laughs> and then the armor kind of grows from the head back towards the tip of the tail. So the tail club would be one of the last things growing. And because it's so large, it might be growing really fast. These are still sort of hypotheses not things we know for sure, but that's my guess. Very neat. Uh, another, our last question here, uh, looking at the time, is from Lam. Lam asks, is there evidence for side preference in ankylosaur tails? Ooh, that's a really fun question. So my gut feeling is yes. The problem is that to answer that scientifically, we would probably need more examples of ankylosaurs. So basically we have a sample size problem. This is always a big problem in paleontology because we just never have enough fossils to do really good statistics and say for sure that it's not just a random observation. Um, but anecdotally, uh, I feel like there's actually quite a bit of asymmetry in tail clubs that I've seen. And Zool is one of the best examples of that because Zool's tail club is really asymmetrical. And one side is actually quite a bit, the, the knob osteoderm is quite a bit longer and larger than the other side. And when you see things like that in modern animals, it could just be a random developmental thing, but sometimes it actually does reflect like use and preference for one side. So it's possible that Zool actually preferred to strike like with its tail in one direction more than the other. And we know that animals have handedness. So if we look at, you know, like human beings have like right or left handedness, um, that absolutely happens in other animals as well. There's a whole line of research on handedness and side preference and lots of different animals. So yeah, it's totally possible that uh, ankylosaurs had a, a handedness to their tail club swinging. Right. You know what? We're getting some more questions. So are you okay if we, if we go a little I'm totally long? fine to answer some more questions. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, this question is from Thanat. Uh, that's it's so interesting. Thank you. Um, are, is there any evidence from other ankylosaurid species? If yes, did any of them point in the other directions? Oh, great question. Yeah. So as far as we know, um, we haven't seen evidence for uh, predation on other tail clubbed ankylosaurids, but it's hard to tell sometimes. So I say that with like big like caveats like flashing above my head. Um, there have been some interesting examples of ankylosaurs with really broken and healed ribs. So this was what I actually thought a long time ago when I started thinking about how we might look for evidence for intraspecific combat. I thought we might look to rib pathologies. Uh, but part of the problem is it's just really hard to know always what kind of dinosaur you have if you have isolated ribs. Ankylosaurs are actually a bit distinctive because they're very barrel shaped but you would have to go and look at like so many ribs from so many dinosaurs in mm -hmm. order to tell. Uh, but there are some really cool examples. There's a couple of specimens from Mongolia that have some very gnarly broken and healed ribs and you could easily see that being from a tail club impact as well. Lam again asking, uh, Lam noticed um, Zool's left knob is overgrown covering another osteoderm. Could it be inflamed or diseased? Yeah, so that's a great observation. I have a suspicion you've looked at the original research paper describing Zool. So yeah, the uh, the spikes going down Zool's tail club, um, the, the tail club knob is kind of touching and possibly overgrowing one of those other tail spikes. And yeah, we're not exactly sure what's going on there. It kind of looks like exactly what you're saying. It might've been inflamed or diseased, maybe from repeated use and strikes um, hitting another ankylosaur, but we're not really sure. It's really weird looking. Hmm. There's a, another question from Ken. Uh, uh, Ken asks, are there signs of regeneration in the damaged areas? And I think you were saying um, you are seeing that and that's how you know it didn't happen after the animal had died. Is that correct? 
Exactly. Yeah. So that's the the really key thing here is that the the bones are healing. So maybe what a uh, what I should clarify is that it's not um uh it's not going to sort of necessarily grow the whole spike tip back. Uh, so it's not kind of like regenerating, like when a lizard loses its tail and grows the whole tail back out again. Uh, so what we're seeing is that it, where we once had a nice pointy spike, the tip is missing and then the bone kind of grows over and then we end up with this blunt osteoderm instead of a spiky one. Very neat. Yeah. And Andy is asking, did female ankylosaurs have a tail club? Uh, I, I get this question a lot. Yeah. This question is super hard to answer because it is actually really hard to tell boy dinosaurs from girl dinosaurs. So it's really okay. hard to tell males from females. Um, one of the only ways that we have to really definitively tell right now, if you have a female dinosaur, is if that dinosaur was just about to lay eggs, they make a special kind of tissue inside the hollow part of their bones called medullary bone. And if you cut that bone up and you see that special tissue type, you know for sure that you have a female dinosaur that is about to lay eggs. I'm sure you can see how this is a real kind of like needle in a haystack scenario to wind up with that you have to fossilize a dinosaur that was just about to lay eggs but hadn't laid them yet and you have to cut it up and take a look for this bone. Um, if you don't see that special tissue it could be a female that hasn't has just laid eggs or isn't going to lay eggs or it could be a male. So it's basically impossible to tell if you have a male dinosaur and only possible to tell if you have a female about to lay eggs. So the, that's a very long answer to say we haven't definitively identified any female ankylosaurs, but that's definitely on my mind. And it's a question I get asked a lot. Uh, ankylosaur tail club knobs come in a really wide variety of sizes. And some of that probably has to do with what age they were when they died. So, you know, where, like what growth stage they were at. Some of it probably has to do with males and females too. And it's just really hard to answer that question right now. And I imagine the question comes from observing modern species uh, and who has this weaponry to battle each other and often what they're battling over is the rights for reproduction is, um, and I suppose that's, <laughs> uh, you often do, are able to um, look at modern species to make those kind of hypotheses. Would you feel safe making a hypothesis like that based on modern animals? Yeah, I think that it's pretty safe to say that the odds are good that male male combat so you know two male zools fighting over mates at some level is a pretty reasonable guess but one thing we have to be really careful about with dinosaurs is that dinosaurs aren't mammals right mm -hmm. um and uh their descendants are birds but birds are so different from you know big di armored dinosaurs like zool it's kind of hard to pull like behaviors uh by looking at modern birds but we also know that modern birds have quite different behaviors um, the way they approach parenting, their chicks is quite different. So male birds actually do a lot more parenting than male mammals a lot of the time. So we do have to be a little bit careful. Um, but I think it's a pretty it's pretty safe to say that, you know, males and males would probably fight, but probably females and females would fight too. So it's it's an interesting question. Mm, thank, yeah, thanks. That's an important clarification. Yeah. Finally, do you know <laughs> how fast broken osteoderms, osteoderms heal with their high vasculation rate a aid in that healing? That's a great question. And I'm just going to be honest that I have no idea. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea. What I would probably want to do to try to answer that question is to look at animals that have osteoderms today. Uh, so I would want to know like if an armadillo or a crocodile injures their osteoderms, how fast those heal. Um, it's a little tricky because of course, uh, Crocodiles are kind of the closest analog in some ways, but their physiology is quite different. So um, dinosaurs were very warm-blooded. Uh, crocodilians are kind of cold-blooded, so their rates of healing might be different. Um, so that's another super interesting question that probably doesn't have a very easy answer, and I definitely don't know the answer to that. So yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Well, Victoria, I want to add uh, my thanks, uh, Jennifer on Facebook and Rosemary here also in Zoom. Both are really expressing their appreciation for your presentation today and your enthusiasm for the topic. Thank you so much. Um, and if any, if you're watching, uh, thank you so much for joining us. 
uh, if you enjoyed it and you want to see some more of Dr. Arbery, you can visit the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel for other programs we've hosted, including What's New in Canadian Paleontology and Leafing Through the Fossil Collection. Uh, and that one, I think my dog makes a, a he, he tries to steal <laughs> the scene by rolling around on the sofa in the background. This was back when we were at home. <laughs> and if you're in the Victoria area, here in Victoria, BC area, <laughs> join us on Wednesday, February 1st, uh, when Dr. Arbor will be part of a panel for our topic, Traveling Through Deep Time, uh, at our Live at Lunch series. And Live at Lunch is, a free, is free, and it takes place typically uh, on the first Wednesday of the month at noon in the Royal BC Museum's Conference Hall. We will record that session as well and make sure it gets posted to our YouTube channel. So please do check us out there. Thank you everyone for joining us and take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.